So pipeline driven development is actually perfect because we follow on from the last talk, we, we mentioned our we're using Angular in our example. So uh, that worked out, I think, quite well. Your turn. Well, what Eddie hasn't mentioned is Firebase and Cypress as well. Oh, yeah. Angular is a small part of what we're going to talk about. We're going to look a bit at what do you do when you're building up a pipeline? How do you set yourself up, I'll say, for success? But what are some of the things you can do and how do we actually do that? So we're going to talk at a very high level, obviously, that you can get really deep on this stuff, but we haven't got time for any of that. By all means, talk to us after if you want to know more. So we're going to talk at a high level on how you set up Angular, Firebase, Cypress, and get yourself that initial pipeline all set up so you're nice and smooth going forward. We forgot uh, pipeline. We, by pipeline, we mean uh, the full to deployment all the way from beginning to end. So we're going to use Circle CI as an example uh, for this as well. Yes, so uh, we're from the Code Mortals team. We're live streaming here tonight, so support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel. We really appreciate it. Should we go? Who's first? I can't remember. Is that mine? It's Angular. So who here has used Angular before? Who here prefers Angular? No, I'm just joking. Uh, right, okay, good. So, you know, that's the, for, the, for the live stream who can't see the people in the audience, that was 100% love Angular. I'm just joking. It's about 50%. Okay, fine. So Angular is by Google. Uh, these are all the, the great things that it does. You've probably seen it on its website. We think it's, uh, we think it's really good. I have used React. I've only used Vue a little bit, so I can't, I can't compare. Um, but there are a whole lot of points we practiced, and I've forgotten. I think you should jump in. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots you can do with Angular, right? So it's cross-platform. Like, like, React has their comparisons. Uh, by cross-platform, they're saying things like you've got Ionic available, so you can build a, a mobile app, a PWA, a website, all out of one code base. Um, they focus a lot on performance these days, so they do a lot of tree shaking. When you build up your minified JavaScript, it will remove anything that you're not using. Even if you've got those libraries available, it will just remove all that out and bundle up the smallest thing possible. And certainly with Angular 8 and the new Ivy engine, even better still. Um, they focus a lot on productivity. There's a lot of built-in CLI tools you can use that just generate code for you. Um, and yeah, it's designed around a full development lifecycle. So when you set up a project, you will have Jasmine in there. You will have Protractor, which runs on Selenium in there. We're going to talk about how we set things up differently because whilst those come out of the box, we think there's a smoother way you can do things um, that make development more enjoyable as well when using Angular. So getting started. So if you want to set up an Angular project, one line, we, we need to install Angular globally. Uh, after that, you run a simple command, uh, ng-new, in this case, code mortals, because we're using the example of our website through some of this. Um, there's questions it will guide you through. There's only about three or four questions you get asked. The first one will be, do you want routing? So if you want multiple pages effectively. Uh, so we say yes, typically, to that, because it's very rare you build a website that is truly just one page, but some people do. Um, we then like to use SCSS for doing our obviously CSS work, um, at which point you've got a project working. So you just change into that directory. We run npm start and go to the browser, and that would be what you will see. That's, That's it. It's as simple as that to get an Angular project up and running for anyone that hasn't used Angular. Everyone seems a bit scared of it these days, but um, it really isn't difficult. At which point we can move over to the CI. So that, that was all we're going to say on Angular. It's literally just this is all we're doing, because we're setting up the basic pipeline, right? So we have a working project now. You can see it on the internet if you wanted to but you're not yet deploying it anyway. You've just got a project that's running on your machine. So what do we do next? So the next, next thing we would do is set up our CI. So we've got Hello World. We haven't put any business logic in there. We haven't put any custom designs. It's just a Hello World project. And the next thing we would do on a project is set up CI. Does everyone know what continuous integration is? A lot of people nodding. OK, awesome. So again, for our example, uh, we've used Circle. And we'll, you'll see some Circle shortly. But it's the kind of the, the, the automation engine of your entire pipeline. It will do so much more. And I won't give too much away, but you'll see that coming up shortly. But we find it, it makes the team work so much better together because you're getting frequent uh, you know, kind of feedback all the time. Every time you do a commit and a push or raise a pull request, you're getting that feedback all the time. So it's really, really important. And there's so much many more things you can do on CI. But again, I won't give that away. We'll save that for later. But we find it, it just allows us to develop faster as a team, and we get a lot of, I guess, less, less issues, less defects, less conflicts uh, with our short-lived branches. I won't go into the whole branching discussion, but we're happy to talk about that afterwards. Go on then. So, yeah, I'm mean, just talking through the points very quickly. So, simplifying team processes. If you've got a CI in place, you're sort of embracing standard practices. You're doing pull requests most likely. The pull request will be coming back saying, yes, this has all gone through the tests. Don't worry about running it all on your local machine. 
and just make some of those steps a bit easier for you. The feedback, obviously, every single branch, we, we set it up that every branch will run the full automation suite. Um, for example, we have a, reasonably, a few clients with reasonably complicated projects, but the whole thing runs in sort of less than five minutes, um, typically. And that, so that would be sort of a thousand plus tests typically running. Um, yeah, it upgrades your project confidence. I mean, we're talking about the stakeholders involved in your projects and all those people. Everyone can see it's happening all the time. Build up confidence, yeah, okay, you see the occasional failure that got caught, great, and, and so forth. And you can iterate on that and improve it. Um, and yeah, delivery overheads. I mean, a lot of people focus and think, oh, if we're going to introduce tests and all this other complicated stuff, it's going to take us so much time. But it really doesn't. I mean, we probably have 10, 15% overhead to just maintain this on top of all the work you're doing. That, that includes writing all the updated tests and everything else. It's around only about 15% of our time goes into making sure this is all there and working. And the rest of our time, we can focus on building that functionality up. But don't take our word for it, we're gonna, we're gonna show you. So don't take our word for it, we will show you. We've got some videos, we recorded earlier on today, so it should be good. <laughs> okay, so for anyone that's used Circle, it, it, there's, there's basically two main things to worry about. You have, you have jobs and workflows. The jobs are basically the scripts you want it to run, and the workflow defines how you want those scripts to be executed, one after the other, whether they need to wait for other things. So on the next slide, um, an example of a very simple job might be to build your code. So we're going to have an image, and there's loads of Docker images out there. Circle comes with lots of them. Uh, in this case, it can run a node image. We can first check out the code, we'll do an npm install, and run a build. That, that could be your most simple script to get you started. Now you're just building the code. You know, does this create a minified document? Do, do you get any errors coming up? Other things you can do, you can build docs. I mean, we build readme, um, or should I say manuals within here. And um, those manuals, we want to automate that and get those building every single time. So you can put all these things into your steps. You don't have to focus purely on writing tests. There's a lot more we see that a CI can give you. Go on, next up. Uh, so, and again, a simple workflow can literally be build the code, build the docs, runs those both in parallel. Um, so you don't have to wait for one or the other. Obviously, later on, we will show a little bit more of a complicated CI, but then Circle gives you this. You get to see every workflow that builds through whether that's succeeded or failed, and that can be notified. We notify onto things like Slack. You'll see errors on there. And in more detail, so you can drill into that, and you can keep drilling in. Um, we won't show any more slides on that because it takes too long. So who here uses CI? Oh. Yeah, so people know what it is. A lot of people use it, that's great. Who here does CD, continuous delivery? Who deploys from their CI? Well, a few hands have gone down, but still looking good. Even if you don't, don't go all the way to production, it's still really good to, to at least go you know, one before. Obviously, ideally, production will be best. So whatever CI platform you're using, you can add an extra step that if it's a certain branch, you can then deploy out. So if you're in a feature branch and it's, it's building on CI, you probably don't want that to deploy. Although for some of our clients, we do deploy to a whole production-like environment, but that's a separate, separate story. So when it gets merged into, say, develop, then you'll probably go to a development environment and you might have a staging branch, goes to staging, when you go to master, it goes to production. This allows us, us to de uh, deploy with ease, with confidence, that anyone who's got the permission can just merge a pull request into the right branch and it automatically gets deployed. So therefore you can protect it for certain people and also it's, it's repeatable, it's fast, you know roughly how long it's gonna take because it, it might increase over time as you add more things to your you know, automated test as you add more uh, steps to your CI. For example, we mentioned a few earlier, automated tests, but you also will get things like, okay, we run Lint, automated tests, you might even run performance tests, you might run accessibility uh, tools to do all those sorts of checks. And we've got, we've got, I think, a slide for that in a bit, so I won't go too much into too much detail. And it enables a change, I think is really important. So it's repeatable and people are confident to make little changes and often. So if you can deploy every week, if something goes wrong, then hopefully it shouldn't because you've tested it in production-like environments all the way up. But if it does, you can easily just roll forward. I, I don't understand why people roll back. It's 2019. You just make a quick fix, hot fix branch, however you do it, and then deploy it out 10, 15 minutes later. Because with the automated tests, you're going to get your full regression suite one every time. So we're using Firebase as our, our, to host our site. Um, it's by Google. It's pretty good call. Cool. I use it a lot of hackathons. And we've used it for a few clients, mostly GCP and, and AWS, or even GitHub pages if it's a static site. But the principles are, are still the same. It is, you can get your CI to deploy straight out. But this is how simple it is. So when people say, oh, I haven't got time to do CD, it, it is so simple. You're gonna have to do this locally on your machine. And when you get someone else to join, they're gonna have to do, do the same. And 
it's not, you have to do that, but it's not so repeatable and you can't check it. Someone else might do it different, might get a different version. Whereas if you've got it in your, in your CI, then uh, it, makes it, it makes it better. So just install Firebase Tools. Uh, you log in and it will open up a, a browser. You can just log in with your uh, Google credentials and you initialize your project as um, a Firebase project. Uh, it would be just selecting hosting, but you can tick all the other if you want real-time databases and all the rest. Uh, yeah, and then if you've got multiple projects, you can either pick the project you've got, if you've created it via the UI, or, or create a new project. Really, really, really simple. I think that's just the, uh, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, we use disk by default. That's what Angular deploys out, uh, compiles to. So, yeah, pick the directory. If it's single page app, yeah, index the HTML. That's it. Like, literally, this whole process takes minutes. It's great. And it just creates those two files as well. So that's all you get at the end of these two files. Sorry, yeah, So at right. the very end, all you get are two files created. So there's a Firebase JSON and the RC file. And that, that's it. It says it's done. Obviously, you can have a look inside those two files. It will show you what's been set up but they really aren't complicated files. You can manually edit them, manually create them. There's, there's not a great deal to them. Uh, if you do want to see the, some of these files and how they run, we, obviously all the stuff we do is open source. You can check out our GitHub website project and you'll see it all on there if you want to see what goes into those files without setting it up yourself. But it really is as simple as running one command and answering the questions. Um, finally, when it comes to the CI, when you do want to put this to a continuous integration server, you will need a token. Firebase has a method for doing that. You just run Firebase login CI. It will generate a token to build, bring a web page first. And then as an example at the bottom, that's all you need to run is Firebase deploy with that token from your CI. We'll get to the Cypress stuff. I know uh, Aris is really keen for us to show the Cypress stuff. So uh, yeah, we can talk about, uh, this, is our, so this is our CI, um, the image that we're using, some of these steps. We just added a few more steps in. So before you might have seen right at the beginning, the, uh, it was building. Now we're adding it to, to deploy it, or to use this key, and then to deploy the code. And, and that's really it. That's how simple it is. Every project needs to start with Hello World, CI, CD, and all those great stuff. And I keep banging on about that. Right, what have we got next? And then there's the workflow update for that's it. That's too complicated. Okay. <laughs> skip it, skip it. We haven't got time. Okay. You can just add more and more. Uh, this is your section. I can have a break now. Um, yeah, so we've been using Cypress for probably a year now, right? And we used Selenium, Protractor, and a few other things in the past. They were great, but we had lots of stability issues. Certainly, when we moved from Angular 1 through to the latest versions of Angular, Protractor is really unstable. It's not built for the latest version of Angular, uh, even though by default it comes out of the box with that. So we tried a few things, um, Nightwatch, uh, WebDriver IO, but we settled on Cypress because it was just, it was really stable, really easy to use. Whilst there are some limitations, like you can only run it in Google Chrome, they're working on that, they're going to improve that. But to be fair, if it works in Google Chrome, that's all we care about. So. Um, yeah, so anyway, it's, for, it's fast, it's reliable. And so we, we've got test suites that have 1,000 plus tests, and they'll run in a, a matter of minutes, really. It, it, it doesn't take long. It's a bit slower on the CLI, to be fair. Um, so if you are running it locally on a desktop, you will probably see it runs a bit quicker, which is interesting. Um, it does real-time reloading, so if you wanted to just run a particular feature file and you're just working on one area, you can monitor that as you make the changes to the code. It will just keep on rerunning that in the background. You can see are you getting it better or worse. And it also supports time travel. You'll see we've got a little video in a minute. Um, when, it run this, when you run the test, you can click back to the history and actually look and see what's going on. You can then even open the inspect console, see everything that was going on at that point in time. So even if all your tests have run and they've taken a couple of minutes, you can go back to the first test, see what actually happened and follow that through manually by clicking down the, uh, the interface, which is quite cool. Uh, and obviously, it's all there for continuous regression testing. You should be always regression testing. There's no reason in, it, in today that you wait till the very end to regression test all your code. People still talk about it because they're stuck in the past, but the reality is regression testing, you can do it all the time. You don't need a big manual process to run it all. Um, you can, really can do it with Cypress. So uh, also some other benefits of using uh, a tool like Cypress, let me move out the way so you can see, is uh, when it's running on CI and uh, it's running headless, it also records videos. So if something does go wrong, it takes screenshots, just like Protractor and, and Selenium, but also records videos. So you can actually watch the video being played, which is actually really interesting. So if something fails on CI and you can't replicate it lo locally, you do get a video of, of, of the tests running, which we were hoping to show you. Uh, but um, 
If not, it's in the repo. Again, our slides, I can talk about our slides really quickly. They're open source and on GitHub. So we've coded our slides. So if there's anything wrong with our slides, any typos or any mistakes or anything else you'd like to add, then please you know, send a pull request through. We're using the Reveal.js framework for that. I, I, this is my contribution, this little label on the right-hand side. It did take me like a, 10 minutes. So this is what it'll look like on, on CI. When it's running on CI, this is what it'll look like. And in a second, uh, it will switch to, to the UI. This is what you would see on, on your UI. Sorry, locally, when it's running on your laptop, uh, you'll actually see it running through the steps. And um, you can see uh, the steps down the left. You can jump back in time, as Andrew said. And you can even, even inspect, uh, OK, you can, it's got this, what's next. But you can even inspect, inspect the, the console and see what's happening to the code at, at that particular time, which is, which is great. Sorry? See it again one time? See it again? Okay, it was like a 20 second video. It was so quick. As long as Aris isn't throwing anything at us, we're, I think we're okay for a few more minutes. We're almost done now, I think, anyway. Ish. No, I'm just lying to Aris. But yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And it's going to run, like, I, like Andrew said, it can run a thousand tests in about five minutes, and then we do another three, four minutes to a deployment to redo deploying to GCP at the moment. Yeah, well, Cypress, is, again, everything is an NPM install. Um, Cypress, we, we use Cucumber with Cypress, and we're going to talk about a little bit about why we're using Cucumber with Cypress. So Cypress is great. Um, there's lots of really cool stuff you can do, but if you're just writing it raw from their docs, it can become quite a pain to maintain. Um, but yeah, all you need to set it up is literally install it. We have a couple of scripts. We've just popped them on there. Yeah, we run a build, uh, we start it up, and then once it's started up, you can run Cypress either. Cypress Run will give you the CLI, or Open will give you the interface on the desktop. Uh, this is what a typical Cypress test would look like if you were not using Cucumber. Um, so this is more Jasmine driven, so you can see you're doing a describe at the top, we're saying user authentication, uh, we're going to do a successful user login. The first thing it does is visits the login page, it grabs the form um, element, we then grab each of the inputs. They get the idea, input, Skip. Aris is going to kick us in. off in a minute. This is, this is what you don't do. This looks awful. Let's move to what you do do. But it does work. It does work, yep. But Cucumber, on the other hand, we, we, we get the Gherkin syntax with this. So by Gherkin, we're talking about a given when then. So given there's a precondition, when I perform some kind of action, then there's going to be something that happens. Does anyone use Cucumber? Can some similar hands in the room every time. Um, yeah, so. By comparison, we can write something that looks like this to the user. Benefits here, obviously, are if you're talking to the business, they can read this, they can understand it, whereas if you're, I'd given them that previous script, they'd look at it and probably just walk away. Um, so we want to have a conversation with them. We don't want them to walk away. But yeah, by writing this, we can say, OK, we're going to go to the login page. Um, we find the username field. We put a value in there. We find the password field. Login button should then become enabled. Click it. Page opens. Likewise, we can do pretty much the same thing for the sad path. So if you look, all the, almost all those steps are the same as I jump between those. The difference being that we put a different password in that's not valid, and we have a different condition we're expecting at the end. We're staying on the login page, and we're seeing a message to say that the credentials were bad. Um, what sits behind that? Well, it's still Cypress behind that. So every step definition, you do still have to add a bit of code. Um, so in this case, we've got the, an example just of opening the page up. So when I open a particular page, so now we can reuse that step. We can put any URL we want in as a replacement for that string. It's just a regular expression at the end of the day. Um, and it will visit that page. Um, likewise, for each of these steps, there will be a bit of code behind each one, a couple of lines long. The nice thing there is as we want to do more things, like we could add an additional check within this page to actually validate, did you get to that page? So you can iterate on each of these steps as well. And everywhere you've used that step will benefit from it straight away. Um, so yeah, Cucumber, pretty awesome, makes life really simple, reusable. And if there is a major upgrade to Cypress that occurs that changes the name of things, all you're doing is updating step definitions. I think on our project, probably the most complicated one has maybe 50, 50 step definitions that we use in there. There's not many, um, but it can drive a thousand tests from that and people can read those tests. Uh, so some of the benefits, I've already mentioned a few. Uh, in fact, do you want to talk through them? I've talked quite a bit just there. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I mean, everyone can read that, so I'm probably not going to just read it out. I was quite keen to, to build on what you were saying a second ago, which is it bridges the gap between uh, the tech and non-tech. So, I mean, in, even in some projects, we've gone as far as having the business analyst, when they want to make changes, uh, or sorry, business analysts would write some of those uh, Gherkin syntax, and we would just bring it into our project, 
uh, and then we run the tests and you'd get like 10 failures and one by one we'd make them pass and then we know we've, we've satisfied what they want. And if they do want any changes, if you've got, a, a, I guess, a business analyst or a product owner who's a little bit more technical, they can just, you know, hit edit button on GitHub, change the, the if they, after you log in, for example, they don't want to go to the accounts page, they want to go to a dashboards page. They can hit edit on that test file and then just change what the, where it goes um, and submit create a PR and it's going to fail. And then I know I've got a PR to make it go green, I can update the, uh, the code to make that test pass. And then when the client's happy, they can merge it and it just deploy straight out to production. I mean, you can just keep it really, really slick. Depending on how many layers and what kind of, you know, BS and stuff you have. But yeah, you can keep it simple and slick and little and often. But uh, yeah, I think that's it. It's just, we use it a lot now over the last quite a few years and it's just yeah, made our lives a lot easier and really bridged the gap. What else have we got? So yeah, automate everything is what we want to say is the bottom line. So on CI, as I mentioned before, or we've mentioned functional tests, I mentioned earlier on, you can do performance and accessibility. You can also add security. There's like from the OWASP, you've got ZAttack proxy and all the other bits and pieces you can add to your CI. And we've mentioned deployment. So you can keep building on your CI. And then with Circle CI, which Travis can't do, um, is you can do things in parallel. So I think you should saw those two, two boxes. You can actually have a whole kind of, we should have taken one, a picture of one of our more complicated ones. You can have a whole spider diagram where you can't continue past a certain gate until all the all the all these have passed. Say for example, deployment won't happen until all these are green, and then it, then it would happen, uh, and so forth. So you can have all these all this great stuff. But yeah, automate everything. Automate yourself out of a job. Definitely, that's what we try and do, right? Uh, yeah, you, you, I'm going to talk about this one because I think TypeScript's amazing. You should always use it. Uh, Andrew really likes this last one, so I'll, I'll let him say a few words on that one. Uh, that, that that was put there as mostly a case of yeah, read the documents, but. Documentation, it varies so much. We have a great struggle with third-party documentation. So if you do work and build APIs, third-party APIs for other people to consume, make your documentation open source so we can fix it. Because the number of times I've used documentation that is wrong, out of date, or just really difficult to follow. It, it, yeah. But read it anyway, because if you don't read the documentation, you don't find some of the gems. And you learn a lot by reading it and having problems as well. But uh, yeah. I just want to add one more to that. And if you find a mistake in open source documentation, just raise a pull request, just fix it. And if you figure something out, like if it went from step one to two, and there's like a, one and a step one and a half that kind of, it's easy when you know how, but if you don't know and you struggle on it, just add that back. The amount of open source uh, contributions I've made, which are just adding in like a hidden step, which I think most people just assume it's easy, or, or the authors of the project assumed it was easy. But when you're coming to use it, it's not. And uh, then that will just help your open source contributions, helps the community, and like I always say, helps you find your next job or more money. That's a different conversation as well. I think I can answer this one because Andrew, or well, you're welcome to answer, Andrew didn't want to use Firebase for this demo, he wanted to use AWS or GCP. So it's just for the demo. We actually really don't use Firebase for our clients. So I haven't built any huge scale projects on Firebase, we just use AWS or GCP. I need to add to that, we do sometimes use it. I wouldn't say we don't. When you're prototyping and you're in the early yeah. phases and you're doing the proof of concepts and the user base is low, Firebase is really easy, gets you going. Um, actually, we recently did have one project that then jumped from Firebase. It jumped so quickly in users, we had to move somewhere else. Um, and it, we actually moved to GCP storage with a load balancer on the front. Um, it took about half a day to make that transition and then deployments, URLs all got moved. It, was, it, was, it wasn't that difficult. It does depend on your project though, it really does. So if you've really got a very complicated project with, and you're running lots of microsites on the front end, I mean, on the back end, we're not necessarily running Firebase or that for a lot of things. We use Firestore for stuff, Firestore's quite cool for real time. But um, yeah, it really varies on your project needs. As you say, you can't, there's not one shoe fits all. It's, you, you've got to think about your project, think about the user base. But for a small project, getting started proving things, Firebase is really good and it is cheap at that level. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the challenges on using Cypress, especially in comparison to good old, but sometimes annoying Selenium? I want to say one thing, I'm going to pass it to Andrew, because one thing that comes to mind when people say that is, oh, but I want cross-browser from Selenium, I want to be able to use Selenium Grid, go cross-browser, use tools like, uh, not source making, uh, I can't think of the, the site where you can kind of farm out and take videos of all the mobile devices and all the rest. Source Labs. Oh, source making, that's pretty close. Uh, but how often do projects actually go grid and go cross-browser? A lot of the time, I think nine times out of 10, most projects have just used what, pick one browser, Chrome, the fastest one usually, because they want a test suite to run really fast. So 
Yeah, that's my answer, and I'm, I'm, and I know Andrew's got some passionate thoughts on the subject too. Yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's always problems. Everything's got problems. Um, there's there's no idea. I think some of the problems that we've had responsive stuff. Whilst you can have different configs for Cypress and say different breakpoints and all the rest, you don't necessarily get all the mobile headers in there and things like that. So if you do want to do all the cross browse across responsive stuff and you've got a big need for that, then perhaps Cypress isn't quite ready yet. They are doing a lot of work to get into that space, but they're not ready yet. It's one of the bigger problems, uh, well, I suppose, it, I don't think this is Cypress specific, but mocking data. So a lot of the time on the front end, we like to run a test suite that just mocks all the back end. You can do that. They have fixtures that you can run and just load and integrate, interact with the network on there. That works quite well. Um, when we're doing stuff with Firestore, so on our uh, the website we've been building for Code Mortals, we're using Firestore. That was really fun trying to get the fixtures to work. Um, we looked at different ways of doing that, but we managed to get something working. It was by very much manually inspecting it. But that, that's a problem you get everywhere else. So are there any real problems that I've had with Cypress? I'd say I haven't actually experienced anything that's been that problematic. It's, it's been fairly smooth running for the last year. I, haven't, I couldn't say there was anything apart from the questions around cross-browser that come up. Uh, everything else, I mean, it runs on, the, on CI fine, it runs locally fine, it's quick. Um, yeah, I haven't really hit anything that I'd say has been a major blocker um, for any client that's had a particular requirement that says, I need this and you haven't got it. Okay, we're going to have five minutes to break.